I was watching a video from Case Western University a couple of days ago, which I, if I remember I'll put in my favourites. And um, I've been thinking about it quite a bit since, it was really interesting. Uh, it was about the origins of language and why humans are particularly capable of such complex expressions through language and the possible relationship between language and thought, I guess. Uh, and there, well, there's a lot of things that were really interesting about it. And it. It was pretty speculative, and the guy who did the lecture, I can't remember his name right now, did say it was speculative, but that aside, I just thought it was really tantalising. The first point he made was that um, uh, there are a few species, humans included, which uh, make use of very complex uh, vocal expressions. Not necessarily meaningful expressions, just vocal expressions. And he cited certain songbirds, he cited humpback whales, um, and talked about it in relation to sexual selection, where, uh, for example, a male songbird would uh, evolve the ability to make complex songs because it attracted uh, members of the opposite sex, or female songbirds. So it's kind of like the auditory equivalent of the peacock's tail. It has that, it's a very complex organ of display, I suppose, um, without necessarily any semantic meaning. Uh, in fact, he said that you know some animals do have semantic expressions, where warning cries, that kind of thing, but they're usually simple, and you don't need a very complex express, uh, expressive vocal technique to uh, to express the few things you need to express warning cries. So he was contrasting that. He was saying that, as I say, there's just these few species which have this ability to uh, make very complex sound patterns, what he kind of describes as a series of clicks and pops and squeaks, uh, hundreds of times a minute that we all make, uh, that we don't recognize as such, we just think of as language. And uh, songbirds typically have dozens or hundreds, or in some cases thousands of different patterns that they can draw on, and humpback whales and one or two other. Uh, animals can do likewise. The difference, of course, between ourselves and songbirds and ourselves and humpback whales is that we are capable of um, modulating that flow and giving it some kind of semantic content. So the sounds that I'm making right now, whilst in some kind of pre-human history, might have been considered songs that I was say to attract members of the opposite sex doesn't seem to be working for me, by the way, but um, the, uh, that's not primarily how we use it now, I don't think, maybe we do, but that's not primarily how we use it now, we use it to kind of sculpt concepts and to put concepts in lines one after the other and try to communicate those concepts to other people. Where am I going with this? Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because of the, the speculative bit of this guy's talk was where he moved on to... Um, an idea of how that stream of song could be organized into semantic content, what kind of uh, pre-adaptation, as he called it, what kind of pre-adaptation, what kind of existing feature of our, uh, of our being um, could be exploited in order to provide a shape to that set of squeaks and pops, as I say, give it some meaning. And the one that he chose was um, sight, perception, visual perception. And as he rightly pointed out, visual perception is incredibly complex, incredibly sophisticated. We take this uh, chaotic pattern of input, inputs that we're getting from our eyes, little flashes and blinks of light, and little uh, saccades and tiny little points of focus, thousands of them per second, and somehow manage to construct it's really complex, meaningful world around us, and we do it so well that we don't even know we're doing it, so it's completely innate and unconscious. Uh, what he speculated is that that process, the logic of that process, the grammar of that process, if you like, uh, could be used as a structure, uh, as a pre-adapted structure, to give form to the um, set of trills and pops and squeaks that come out of our mouths when we're trying to sing or as we now call it, speak. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example he gave. I think he gave this, this idea that, um, for example, when we look around, we look at a tree, we turn away, we look back, there's a tree again, 
there's a kind of logic to that pattern of looking at, looking away, looking at again, which is um, recurrent in language and thought through things like how memory works within sentences. When we speak a sentence, the, the object that we're referring to at the beginning of the sentence is the same one that we refer to back We come back to the same object at the end of the sentence uh, in a way that kind of follows the logic of, of, of visual perception coming back to an object after having looked away. Uh, I don't know if, that's, if that idea that he had was correct or not, but it sounds like the kind of idea that I think that would need to produce in order to be able to account for complex language and indeed complex thought concept, concepts. What it's got me thinking about is, you know, the extent to which the organisation of concepts that we have, both consciously and non-consciously.